Hey guys, Dr. Z, welcome to the Z Dog MD Show. Today I have Damian Walter. I've been wanting, okay, listen, I saw Damian on Rebel Wisdom podcast with my friend David Fuller, and they were talking about Dune and the mythology of Dune and science fiction and a new 21st century mythology. Now, why am I on a medical podcast purportedly are we talking about mythology? Well, because it is central to who we are as humans, finding meaning, purpose, and a, a telos, a direction of where we're going. And COVID has really highlighted this. Now, Damien is a writer and a storyteller. He's been featured in BBC, The Guardian, The Independent. Whenever I say The Independent, Damien, I, I think of Trent Krim, The Independent from the Apple uh, <laughs> show. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm I'm stereotyping now. Uh, he's Ox He's been published in Oxford University Press. He's the former director of creative writing at the University, uh, University of Leicester. Is that how you say that? Leicester, but Leicester. Leicester is fine. We wouldn't persecute you if you said that in the city of Leicester. We'd let you off. <laughs> <laughs> Anything I missed on this? Because you, when I saw your your episode with David, you are you go so deep on the mythology and the the mm. foundations of science fiction. What am I missing here? Well, actually, you know, the beginning of my career was in over more in the, the healing practices, you could say. I, I'm in no way a, a qualified physician, but I was basically a social worker wow. uh, using the arts, uh, development worker it's called at the time. Uh, and I did that in the, in the city of Leicester uh, for about 10 years. I went there for university and it's a great city, but it has real problems with poverty. Uh, it has uh, big immigrant communities who were kind of struggling to, to integrate. And uh, I was using arts and specifically writing and storytelling. And I would do like um, storytelling workshops in old people's homes and schools and prisons. And uh, I did a lot of work with mental health communities. And I got fascinated by uh, what stories mean to people that we're all living out a story. And when I encountered people who were struggling in life in whatever way it was because on some level their story was broken ah. uh it didn't fit in the world they didn't think they were fulfilling their story this can get really pathological it's kind of crazy how your your sense of your being in the world can determine so much of your your health or maybe not crazy at all actually uh and during this point i decided to go back to university essentially and study stories and storytelling. And then I spent about another 10 years doing that, trying to understand just this really basic question, like what is a story? Because wherever we think about life and society, we get stories and we get storytelling. We spend a huge amount of our life watching stories. We talk about like political narratives and how we marketed stories. I could do a big list, you know, but we didn't really seem to know what stories were. So I set about trying to figure that out. And that eventually resulted in my uh, my course, uh, which is called The Rhetoric of Story, that has like a little bit over 30,000 students now. And it's kind of answering this question, what is a story? So the, that's, the, that's me so far. And, 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 and honestly, this is why I was drawn to you because you know, science fiction is cool and all that, but this idea that story mm. is the underlying fa fabric of how humans find connection, mm. meaning, purpose, and even beyond that, a sense of identity, this idea that now we're in a COVID pandemic that has caused this thing, which in the States, I don't know what they're calling it elsewhere, but, and you're in Bali right now, which there are definitely worse places to be <laughs> than that, it's beautiful. <laughs> this, the great resignation is what they're calling it, where people are realizing they're looking inwards. They've been through this traumatic event, this global international fear contagion, and and they're looking inwards and saying, wait, is this my story that I'm living in this life? And they're starting to wake up and say, no, it's not. Why am I working in this job that doesn't, it's not who I am, It's my story feels broken. And they're not saying it this way, but this is how I think I'm seeing it, is mm -hmm. people are having a story crisis. Does that feel, correct to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the reasons I uh, love to live in Bali is because of the culture in Bali. So it, wherever you go in Bali, they have statues of the gods and they have ceremonies and every village has its own temples and ceremonies and they all do this together. And I knew that 
whatever happened with COVID, you remember back at the beginning of COVID and there was the sense that, you know, it's been very bad, but it could have been much worse. Yeah. Uh, and I thought Bali will be fine because there's a real story holding everybody together mm. here. Mm. And you know that when you're here and, you know, it's a very conservative religious story in a sense. And then you look to like where I grew up in the UK and uh, like in the commute about coming into London, where the, the people are who are resigning en masse from their jobs now. And there's no real shared story mm. left. It's a story of going into London, maybe working in a bank, trying to build up your fortunes, whatever it is. And it's not enough for people on the level of meaning. This is what John Vivekey calls the meaning crisis. You know, that this yeah. kind of new story we've made for ourselves it doesn't fulfill all of our needs on the level of meaning and identity and togetherness as a society. And I think COVID just cracked. It. So, <laughs> Someone doesn't want your story so. told, Damien. <laughs> yeah, COVID just cracked that open Th that's and left us seeing it. That's exactly mm -hmm. correct. This idea that you know, Viveki calls it the meaning crisis. There's the atomization crisis too, where we've been fragmented mm -hmm. into parts and we've lost sight of what this whole is. And when we even look at the pandemic, there's all this tension between autonomy, our own independence and freedom and right to wear a mask, not wear a mask, get vaccinated, not get vaccinated, and communion, which is the bigger picture. Should we have lockdowns? Should we ask some people to sacrifice? Should we you know, mm. harm the poor preferentially, because it seems like that had been done. You know, that tension between autonomy and communion, what Ken Wilber, who I think we, we were both quite familiar with his work, call, calls, you know, sure. the whole on. We're all a whole in ourselves, but we're also part of a bigger whole. It's kind of a fractal reality. And that story, that fundamental story of disconnection is something that has actually been especially rampant in the US. And as a healthcare professional, we see that manifest in the form of depression, anxiety, opioid abuse, substance abuse, suicidality, mm -hmm. all these kind of things. And you're right, I think COVID has just kind of blown it open. So how is it that understanding story can actually, can actually save us or help us? Because we don't have that fundamental mythology anymore, mm. like in Bali. Yeah. yeah, you know, when I was kind of, growing through and developing all of these ideas. I had a good friend who was a, a Jungian psychotherapist. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was very interested in uh, becoming very interested in mindfulness and meditation. And she said, you know, Damien, the, the problem that you'll find with that path, like the meditation and mindfulness path, is that it's made for people thousands of years ago who had a really solid ego sense and they had a place and a story and then at some point as they got older in life they needed to be broken out of that place and a story and that's what they would do with meditation or mindfulness or retreating to a temple and the problem for nearly all western people yourself included my friend pointed at me is saying that really none of us have strong identities because we're in this kind of uh this whirlwind of change, like technological change, social change. Uh, I can look back at like my family history and one side of my family all lived in the same village for like 700 years until about 1900. And then they just get thrown all over the world. Uh, you know, we're all immigrants to new countries. So we all have these broken stories, broken identities. And what we do is storytelling. Like you can look at something like, um, Jordan Peterson's self-authoring program, which has put some of this into the mainstream, is we can build a sense of identity. This is what we do in therapy. Uh, it's kind of go back and reconstruct our story together. And I've been through that process. I found it really useful. Mm. But I think what we're also doing now, and it's, it's questionable how healthy this is, is investing in like pop culture stories. So this is one of the reasons I'm so interested in science fiction is that it provides so many of the stories that we put our identity into now, like the number of people who grew up with, with Luke Skywalker, perhaps as our kind of iconic model of self or another similar character. Uh, but there's real, there's problems with investing so heavily into these kind of shared, shared mythologies as well. Uh, we can dive into this because it was Star mm -hmm. Wars 
the collective mythology of Star Wars that was my gateway into everything story-wise, in, including mm -hmm. personal meaning. Because, you know, I was, it was 77 when it came out. I was four years old when I saw it in the theaters with my dad. And I remember it vividly. I remember the saga of rooting for this kid who comes out of nowhere mm -hmm. and blows up this thing. And that last sequence with the, the trench and the Death Star where there's so much tension ratcheting up, everything is on the line. And this kid from BFE, you know, butt fuck nowhere, comes out and, <laughs> and does it with an assist from a guy who's technically a bad guy. He's a smuggler and a pirate. And they destroy this mechanistic symbol of the empire, the, the system that we're mm -hmm. all stuck in. And I felt it intuitively <laughs> at age four, so much so that I dragged that into my career as a doctor where I created this character when I started doing videos as a kind of cry for help, I created this character, Doc Vader, who is Darth Vader, as a physician, he used to be this idealistic Anakin Skywalker who over uh -huh. the course of his medical training and career was twisted into the dark side of mechanized medicine, this health 2.0 that we're in where everybody's a commodity and it's an assembly line optimization. And, th and that character actually got so much traction because people identified with the mythology that came out of Star Wars, yes, but also mm -hmm. with their own story. They said, you know what? That guy feels a lot like me certain days. Um, it's powerful. And in the absence mm. of say a biblical mythology or a common religious mythology or what you have in Bali, which is the, I imagine the Buddhist uh, iconography and mythology, it was the next best thing it seemed. But you're saying maybe there's even a, there's a downside to creating it in a popular way that way? Mm, sure. Uh, you know, these are like the oldest stories, these hero myths, mm. and they have a real, real purpose. And every uh, traditional society would have their version of the hero myths, which you get told. And they're uh, about inducting the youth into society, essentially. Um, and this is about, there's a phase that we reach in life where we kind of form our heroic personality. You know, we could segue into Ken Wilbur from here, but maybe maybe not quite yet. But there's like a, a certain energy, uh, like Freud called it like the energy of Eros or that. And it's the life energy and it starts coming up. And what are you going to do with this energy? Well, hopefully you've already had this model for you. You've been told the hero story that when you get to the kind of Luke point, you're ready to go off and live life you kind of you find your group of friends and you go on a journey and you defeat an enemy of your people and then you come back and you're celebrated by your people and these stories would be integrated into kind of bringing especially young men who are going to have this energy very often in spades uh, into the society and they're saying if you use your energy for this you will be celebrated by the society. So don't turn into an arsehole, <laughs> you know, become a hero instead. And that's the point. If you have this story, but it's not integrated into a society for your, most people, especially young men, I think you see it, who now face, I think, very, very massive systematic challenges in society that we're underestimating. Uh, then you try and go and do something heroic, but nobody notices. And there's no community there to celebrate you when you're doing it. And so it kind of becomes pathological mm. if you're given this, this hero's model. And so instead, it's easy to invest that energy into video games, for instance, which give you this kind of artificial sense that you've taken the hero's journey and done something productive with your, with your time and life. Uh, and I think this is, it's a really major downside of these pop cultural, uh, mass media, very commercialized heroes narratives that we fill society with, that we're not then integrating them back uh, into the culture. And when I was working in Leicester, you know, with a lot of very young men who had a lot of very different issues, I could see after a long time doing it, that it was the lack of the fulfillment of their heroes journey, which was so much a massive part of the problem. Oh, wow. You know, that really resonates as someone who was once a young man. It was this mm -hmm. idea that you're on this, you leave home, you go on this quest. And again, 
you're kind of infused in this from everything from Star Wars, Star Trek, Dune, which we can always talk about. You did a beautiful thing with David on Dune. Um, all, all, you know, The Matrix, th these are all heroes' journeys. Some of them have the mm -hmm. savior element. And that idea that if the expectations are here for the hero's journey, you don't have the community to celebrate what journey you do take. You, you, you turn inwards and it becomes kind of maladaptive and you can never live up to the hero's expectation. And for me, that was actually a very frustrating point in my medical career. I was a hospital doctor at Stanford and I felt like I was living someone else's hero story at one point because I, I, you know, I was like, this isn't me. Like, if I feel like anyone can drag and drop and do the job I'm doing that's been trained. But I have, mm. this, I have this set of things I wanna do in the world that are not just this, and how do I do that? And that feeling of failure, it's, it's almost a shame component. It turns inwards. It's like, please don't look mm. at the core of me because it's so broken because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And I think the expectation of the hero's arc definitely contributes to that. Um, mm. But then the question is, how, Damien, how is that different than say, you know, the heroic tales of, you know, the Greeks or the other past mythologies, pre-modern mythologies and so on? Yeah, I what you're you see the difference in is that we take a character like uh luke skywalker and we send him on his hero's journey and he defeats the empire and he comes back and he's a hero and then a little bit later on we do look like in the later movies we look and we see him like on the uh alone on the island that he's kind of retreated from society so then we start to look at the other side of the story but when we told traditional heroes journeys like there's a fantastic story uh, called The Listener, which is from the Navajo Indian tribes. Mm -hmm. And The Listener is a hero's journey, but the hero is destroyed on the journey. Uh, everyone he comes into contact with is somehow untrustworthy. He's recruited like by the uh, this group of women come along in a canoe and they take him off in the canoe and then they completely abandon him in the, in the wilderness. Uh, and the point of the story is that there's a cost to the hero's journey, you have to pay the cost mm -hmm. as well. But we only show one side of the story. So if you're given the cost as well, then you can say when you're fulfilling like your doctor role that isn't satisfying, I'm paying the cost of being the hero mm -hmm. of doing something for the world uh, as well. And that's an important part to integrate into the story, but it's it doesn't make the same uh, commercial box office fodder to tell that story, unfortunately. You know, that that's really well put because Luke Skywalker pays a cost, he loses his hand. He finds out something mm. horrifying about his own paternity. Uh, you felt in that second movie, the sense of, of dread and despair by the end of that movie, that you were mm. paying the cost. It was almost, you know, in, in, in meditation circles, which, which it sounds like you are very familiar with and I am as well, there's this idea of the dark night of the soul where mm -hmm. as you progress through your realizations, you realize, oh, maybe the self isn't what I thought it was. If you did not have a very stable sense of identity before, I feel like it might be quite destabilizing when your identity shifts to, oh, I'm actually much vaster. And this thing was really just a story. Oh my gosh, how destabilizing, how horrible this mm -hmm. thing that I, I never even really properly formed and it's not real. And uh, and so people really can struggle with that. And I wonder if it was as common in the old days when there was that, a different mythology and the idea of paying the cost mm -hmm. in the sense, like you said, that you had this identity and this story kind of well-placed before you went on retreat and went to the monastery mm -hmm. and did did those kind of, kind of processes. Sure. Yeah, I lived in uh, Chiang Mai for a few years before I was in Bali, and there's a, a huge meditation scene and community there, and very large temples where where Westerners, mostly young kids from Europe, a lot of Americans, go to do meditation retreats. And in the, the Buddhist Sangha that I was part of, which is a Buddhist study group, uh, we would get lots of people who had been on the retreats and were really damaged by the mm. retreat experience, like a 30 day silent retreat. Mm. If you're uh, not, I don't want to say psychologically stable, but if your ego identity isn't really solid going into it, you just hit very quickly 
lots of traumas, lots of psychological issues which are underlying. And actually, I don't, I don't recommend it as a path for young people and for, for many people necessarily. Uh, and it is because of this, this storytelling facet. One of the things I run into when I, I start talking about this with people is kind of the doubt that stories have this much effect mm. on us, that going to watch Star Wars is uh, forming your identity in this way. And of course, it's not, it's not just coming from Star Wars. You don't go to see Star Wars and then become Luke Skywalker. Uh, but we're, we're really immersed in what I use the term for a mythos. And it's uh, an ancient Greek term, classical Greek culture. And they divided culture into the logos, which is all this stuff we think about a lot today. We're very logocentric, uh, logic, science, reason, economics, you know, whatever it may be that we can consciously think of. But they also had a conscious understanding of the mythos. So when you went to Greek theater, watch Sophocles, you were being, you were having your mythos kind of engineered. You knew you were thinking through the stories of your culture, uh, and it was like a sacred experience for you. Mm. But we we taken our mythos and we commercialized it. We we use it for advertising. We're doing it primarily for for money, which is fine. You know, I'm not completely anti capitalist, um, but we kind of lost sight of it that all of these things like our personality, our psychological structures, our stages of development in, in the, you know, the Wilberian model or whichever model you want to use, they're all really bubbling out of this mythos. Mm. And we can tell stories that have an influence on it, that attach certain values to our mythic structures uh, and that have a really big impact on us. But I think because we've lost sight of this, we have lost sight of of how our how we're forming as beings and how our culture is being shaped and that we could more actively uh develop this i think if we again treated it as something of the sacred which i think is a big thing we need back in our culture mm. i uh, man so there's so much here to dive into but the, this idea of the sacred has really been lost and what's interesting is and and this is a story that I've only recently um, been able to tell because just a, a week ago, I came back from a silent uh, six day retreat and I'd not done a full retreat. I, I've only meditated myself for around eight years and am an avid reader of this stuff, in, hyper intellectualize it and so on. And <laughs> I've had experiences and I've had, you know, the psychedelic experiences in the remote past and so on that have opened my mind to the idea that, oh, this is, there's more to this than what it seems. Mm -hmm. And there's even a hint of the sacred there. Now, this is from someone who never went to church, came from a Zoroastrian religious background, which I was really more agnostic most of my life and, and a science-based logos kind of guy. And going to this retreat, um, being in silence with 30 other people uh, creates, there is a sense of deep of peace and the sacred that emerges. And that manifests in a kind of a, a feeling of, intense, unconditional love and compassion, which, mm. you know, was really interesting because you you also talked about the, and, and again, the story, mythos dives right into this. A beautiful story evokes that same sense of mm. sacred compassion. So you, you talked about these 30-day silent retreats in Chiang Mai, and, and I've, it's similar to these Goenka retreats where you don't get a lot of support and you throw people into silence and they face all their unconscious rises up. Even during the six day retreat, I had a lot of unconscious stuff come up and it, and it because there was support and a sense of community around this experience. In the evenings, we would process a bit and have Q and A and that kind of thing. And it was beautiful to see people tell very similar stories. Oh, did you cry most of the afternoon, like curled up in a ball and not know why? You know, <laughs> these kind of things that come up and then feel incredibly light afterwards. Did you feel unconditional love? Were you angry with yourself? Were you feeling shame? All these kind of things came up. The, the, the idea that, you know, you could go to a Greek theater and experience some vestige of that with others in your community, have mm -hmm. it form bonds and a sense of meaning for the whole tribe, as well as for the individual, that's powerful. And I don't think we have, I think you're right. Be because, and the last thing I'll say, <laughs> sorry, you're just, everything you say just really is fascinating in terms of how it's making me think about my own experience because I'm so selfish. The, um, 
the the release of the Star Wars prequels, the one, two, and three, Phantom Menace, was, I, I looked forward to it so much because of the mythos of the original really mm -hmm. resonated and the hero's journey of the original. Then to see the second three be so disappointing to me, so flat and digital and heartless and meaningless, um, was it was it was painful it was hurtful <laughs> like something mm. had been taken from me you know and i think a lot of people in my generation x kind of felt that way about the prequels whereas younger people millennials may have actually enjoyed them and so on How, do you have any thoughts on anything i've said yes i don't know if if i'm alone in this i expect i'm not alone in that that even when i see a good film like a multiplex cinema uh, which is usually in a big shopping center somewhere, more recently in Asia, but previously like in London where I was living before. And I'd have the experience of walking out of the film and the film, let's say it's been great. And I've, I've really had some of that kind of sacred experience. Mm. And I walk out and I'm in a shopping center and uh, all there is is like a commercial <laughs> messaging around me. So and there's like this real sense of disappointment, mm. even if the film is good, you know, and we can talk about what happens when the film is bad mm. um, because there's so much more that needs to go around this sacred experience than just the story mm. at the center of it. Yeah. Like yeah. we have uh, things like something that uh, is talked about quite a lot in, in psychedelic circles, like the uh, Eleusinian mysteries. Mm. And these would be, uh, like storytelling and psychedelic drug experiences combined together that went on for weeks mm. Uh, mm. and were combined with ritual and meditation and community. Or we can go back even further to like the oldest storytelling we can identify, which is cave paintings, like these ancient cave paintings, 15,000, 20,000 years old. And people had spent hundreds of years painting the caves they gather over time and then you can imagine the great ceremonies that would go with going down into the darkened cave of your ancestors and being told the story of the hunter because these are all scenes of of hunting and like becoming a hunter through that experience so we've had all of these uh these things that you know, with our art, and they were all part of one great ritual ceremonial experience that was about self transformation and exploring our depths as human beings. Um, and we've split them all apart. Mm. Uh, and we've lost, in my understanding, the real purpose and, and meaning and function of these. And you said something when you were speaking there, which I think many of us do. And, you know, you, you said, you know, oh, I've had the psychedelic experience because it's like a commonplace thing now. Uh, but you think back to, let's even just say like the 1950s and how rare that psychedelic mm. experience would be, mm. how rare the experience of going to, uh, you know, a rock concert would be, how non-existent the experience would be of going into like a 3d virtual world mm. in a video game or watch even watching a blockbuster movie so we actually have these very powerful um like john viveki might call them psycho technologies and we're doing them at a very high level like synthesized drugs musical experiences art movie virtual worlds computers and all of these things are psychedelic and they're all ritual and they're all opening us up but they're not integrated into mm. anything meaningful so it's like we're being whole generations of people are being kind of opened up beyond our traditional stories but we're not being given anywhere to go oh uh, and i think that's really dangerous I I think I concur with you. You know, when Zuckerberg talks about the metaverse and meta and all of this, it triggers a lot of fear in me because mm. I, I've experienced virtual reality. I've been over to Facebook headquarters. I've, I've seen a COVID documentary. I had a guy on the show who'd made this COVID documentary using VR in the hospital and how immersive and visceral that is. And so this is a very powerful technology. The question is, so what do you do? What, what's, where's the meaning? What's the connection? If it generates more atomization, 
more of this meaning crisis, um, more polarization, then it's an existential threat because I think these technologies are so, they are so powerful to open your mind. You know, just like psychedelics can be, just like meditation can be, just like chanting or prayer or a sense of that community, you know, the ritual. You talked about those cave paintings. You know, I, I remember listening to Joseph Campbell's series with Bill Moyer. And I think he too really talked about when you go in these caves, even now there's this deep, like archetypal experience of like it's mm. pitch black and imagine with just a torch what that was like, first of all, creating it, but then experiencing it. And he didn't mention what you mentioned, which was this idea that, hey, maybe this is how you would teach the young men, like this is what it means to, to come into being a hunter or you know, the sacred nature of the coming of age, which was, was so beautifully pointed out in, in, uh, in, in the cinematography and the whole feeling of how Dune, the new Dune movie actually unfolded as well. Mm. Yeah, it's where we came from. Like we only survived as a humankind because we were able to become hunters and we did something that nothing else that we can point at has ever been able to do. We made this transformation that wasn't uh, evolutionary, wasn't biological, it wasn't in the genes. We developed uh, a whole new pattern of behavior and we did this with storytelling. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, so let's say it's the cave paintings and that made us the hunter. And then at some point later, we, we change that cultural story and we become the farmer mm. instead. And then later on, we, we change the story again and we become like the merchant classes instead. And it's all growing out of our storytelling and it's all still there as well that inside all of us, inside our cultural heritage, is the hunter who was originally came out of those stories. Uh, and we need, to, we need to keep that guy. He's really important to who we are. And, I, okay, and we'll talk about the Will, Wilberian idea of transcending mm. and including our previous stages of development. And the idea of story being, in a way, a creator of reality. In other words, new worlds come into being in the actual through the mm. influence of story. The fact that we're linguistic creatures separates us from most of the other species on the planet, allows us to cooperate flexibly in groups, unlike bees, which they cooperate, but they're inflexible. It's almost genetically determined. We can, mm. you and me who've never met, could do something remotely at a distance yeah. with multiple other people yeah. because we have language and story, maybe a shared mythology, maybe some underpinnings of morality that we share through story. These are crucial. And you know, it made me think uh, when you talked about these, the sort of, that this is not a genetic thing, this is an epiphenomenon of our culture, our language, our story. In 2001, Arthur, or, uh, Arthur C. Clarke's book, but the, the movie with um, Kubrick, they kind of externalized this idea with an alien monolith mm. teaching these apes more or less how to use tools and transforming and the next jump cut with the bone flying as a spaceship. And even just mm -hmm. thinking about it makes me, it fills me with awe the way that that yeah. was transmitted, you know? Yeah, that's why Stanley Kubrick was the greatest, the greatest storyteller of our, of our generation because he did the whole of human history in one, one cut. <laughs> Uh, on a cinema screen, uh, and then said, you know, something that Kubrick is recorded as saying is that uh, he believed that uh, humanity was an evolutionary step towards a truly civilized uh, being. Ah. Uh, so 2001 is about this transformation to becoming something beyond, beyond human and our, our human limitations, which ah. is very much part of like the psychedelic counterculture that that Kubrick was interested in. And he tells that story in, in 2001 and kind of, kind of destroys science fiction as it was at the time, because science fiction had been telling this story about flying rocket ships into space and going to other planets in the same way that we sailed to other continents and just a continuation of the same world that we were living in. And Kubrick, as a great myth maker, said no, no, if we're going to go into space, it's a transformation entirely of consciousness. We have to become something else to get there. 
That that's it's so amazing because you think about something like a Star Trek, which was roughly the same time period, and they were again, mm -hmm. it was like let's take society, let's progress mm -hmm. it a little bit to a more pluralistic, multicultural, um, inclusive society, and let's throw it into space where it meets other cultures mm -hmm. and has to fend in in a very sort of modern or even sometimes pre-modern way. But then Kubrick is saying, no, actually, that's all very animal egoic stuff. You can actually transcend mm -hmm. all of that. And his sequence where David Bowman goes through that whatever wormhole at, uh, you know, with the stars and the lights and the very psychedelic kind of mind expanding thing um, sure. and ends as the star child, uh, this transcendent creature made of energy that, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it, it really was, and when I was a kid, I didn't get it at all. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> like, it's made, it, give, give me, give me a phaser, and you know, yeah, yeah the computer's crazy, and oh, and, and the, the, just the last thing I wanted to say about that was the the symbol, the symbolic gesture of David Bowman turning off Hal's mind, his thinking mind, the the artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, turning it off in order to transcend and escape. It's, mm, it's such yeah. a metaphor for quieting the mind and meditation and transcending the ego and all these things um, that only became apparent to me in the last period of, of my life. Sure, I think maybe you have to have had the, maybe the meditative or the psychedelic experience to have that moment of actually escaping your mind and your thoughts, because this is, uh, this is the, the downside of our, our story-driven reality is that you know it's it's part of our conscious waking mind and it, we're trapped in it uh it's very difficult to escape our stories or even hold consciously that you're in something like a story structure uh like if you, actually if you're dealing with somebody who is very aware that their name is just a symbol uh and that the culture around them is just a made-up narrative that's potentially someone who's in quite a lot of suffering uh at the time you know because it's very there's good reasons i think psychologically why we can't suspend our attachment to the story in the way that dave bowman does he's stepping out of that that conscious thinking mind i think maybe the criticism of 2001 and kubrick's vision and the psychedelic vision and what brings kind of the value of star trek back in a way is that uh i don't think humanity is ready to escape Mm. Our our psychological constructs and the effort to do so has to uh, has to grow and develop over time, you know. And I think this is what the 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 psychonauts and the psychedelic experimenters encountered. That if you try and leap too many stages ahead, you're uh, you're going to hit lots and lots of problems with doing that. And Star Trek is more the reality of the situation that we're in at the moment than a vision of the future. Yeah. We're on you know, a planet with lots of different civilizations at various different stages of development. Uh, we're trying to negotiate between them all. We've got technologies that are far too powerful for our, our psyche and our institutions to really deal with effectively. Uh, and something like the crew of the Enterprise kind of model the, uh, the not quite the scientific, like, the combination of the scientific thinker with the emotionally intelligent as well, the empath mm. and the scientist together, uh, who's sorting these problems out in the, the world around us. You know, I, I, yeah, that's a very good segue into talking about the stages of human development, which I've talked about quite a bit on my mm. show too, because what you're saying with Star Trek, I think is, or how I'm interpreting that is that you must optimize, you, humans don't skip stages of development or evolution. They mm -hmm. have to go through all of them. They can go quickly, but they have to go through. You don't skip. It's just like mm. when you look scientifically at embryonic development, the embryo recapitulates its entire evolutionary history. So at humans at some point have a tail that gets reabsorbed. We have gills that get reabsorbed. Um, that's crazy when you think about it. It, 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 it absolutely. it's absolutely crazy, but it, it is absolutely mm -hmm. necessary. Every single human organism recapitulates almost all of evolution as it unfolds as an embryo. 
And it's the same with human social, economic, technical, psychological development. We mm. have to go through these particular stages. And I think if you talk about the Kubrick transcend the, 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 the rational stage, you might be jumping the gun for human society. In fact, we know you are because mm. the mass majority of humans are not at that level and we're at all different levels around the globe. So maybe that's a good segue to talk about how this kind of idea of story and our COVID situation all relate to these stages of development. Mm. What do you think? Well, it made me think when you you made the the uh, the biological evolutionary comparison that we're so we're so far be behind our understanding and the development of the human psyche and society than where we are in in biology. Uh, we we don't we don't really have the theory of evolution for culture. Mm. yet which is why something like story is is in a sense so underestimated and invisible to us um we've got parts of it we have like the idea of memes and memetics coming from richard dawkins uh and then being kind of picked up in different parts of the culture that we could kind of point to self-replicating ideas as some way that our stories grow and evolve but there are some things that are insufficient about that. Mm -hmm. So that means that I think it's really valuable to talk about development stages, but I'm always uh, try to consciously bring in the, the, the valid critiques of this as well. And, and often to start with them, you know, that we can talk about these stages, but we can't prove their, their, their existence. And we don't want to trap people within them, which is very often the problem of any kind of stage development system. What we want to do is use them as a useful model and see where that gives us some, some benefit. And I think in that way, it's, it's super useful to think of human development and the stages that it, that it goes through whilst recognizing, you know, some of the, the pushback that it, is kind of valid on that as well, because if we're talking about development stages, then I'm, it's impossible not to imply that a tribal society is less developed uh -huh. than uh, a high-tech Western European civilization. Uh, and that's just intrinsic in the discussion. But if we think about transcending and including, the question is, what did we lose from that tribal society that we need to pick up again in in our Western society. And that's a massive, a super valuable area of, of thinking because there are, in a way, it is our stories that we lost. We've, we've abandoned them along the way. Oh. oh, now that makes a lot of sense because in the, in the typical sort of unfolding, you have a phase of development and you're right, these aren't discrete. They're more like these broad, spiral dynamics kind of describes this very well. Mm -hmm. It's these kind of broad ebb and flow where maybe the average of a person or the average of a society, the average of a town is at a certain level, but really it's it's mm -hmm. a scatter plot and every human has different aspects and there's different lines of development. There's lines of emotional mm -hmm. development, mathematical development, physical development, et cetera. So you're not talking about one thing. It's actually rather complicated, which is why I think a reductionist approach to it can be definitely, you can criticize that strongly. This idea that when you go, when you, when you go to a next phase of development, what you've left behind. So the idea that Wilbur really is saying is to do this in a healthy way, you transcend the previous stage and include it within the next stage in a healthy way while integrating or rejecting shadow parts of it that were not useful or, or were shown to be problematic. And I think what we often do in a dysfunctional way, especially nowadays with our divided culture is in different stages, we reject what came before and we either fear mm -hmm. or reject what's the next stage. And that can become very dysfunctional. It creates polarity. It creates a lot of condescension like you, pointed out that, oh, this idea that this tribal group is not as advanced, you know, as whatever. These are growth hierarchies, not dominator hierarchies. So you can't have somebody at a, at a, at a higher stage dominating the other. It's more like you're trying to nudge everybody to be the most healthy they can be at that stage and then transcend and mm. include. So curious your thoughts on that and the role of story in that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult for very good reasons because in any developmental model, in order to achieve the next stage, you, you have to make the separation 
So if you're if you're a teenager, you have to separate from the psychological trappings of, of being a ten year old. Uh, you can't you can't take them with you, and that brings up like feelings of disgust or shame that you were once you know mm. that immature mm. uh and it's very integrated into the it's necessary mm. to go through that so you know i think the simplest uh the model of development stages is the pre-modern the modern and the post-modern and mm. i think it's the most open for people to to speak about and you know, of course, the modern as it's separating for the pre-modern. So the pre-modern is is your religious society, a kind of monotheistic religion holding it all together. And it's very hierarchical and people aren't going to move around in this hierarchy. And of course, the modern that wants to form metropolitan cities and trade and have science and have meritocratic societies, it, it has to, to fight its way out of the pre-modern that came before and we're still rehearsing that fight you know we've been doing it like at least 500 years now and like the new atheist movement was was still having that fight and arguments about does god exist we're still having uh that fight 500 years years on and it was necessary but learning to let go of it is in incredibly difficult especially when now we have the postmodern emerging which is a whole new I mean, if we think about where stories come into this, it's, you know, your pre-modern society is a story. It's one story that holds a large group of people together, maybe a city state. And then your, your modern society is the, the awakening to the need for a universal story mm. that we live in one universe governed by the laws of physics and uh, these economic systems and they can all fit together and we need to get rid of these old stories and then the postmodern is is the deconstruction of the modern that even this universal story you've come up with is still in itself a story still assumes values and this is a very important thing to do but it's a huge fight as well mm. and you know you see in our culture wars the people who are absolutely determined to hold on to the modern and its values uh, and the people now I think we generally call them like politically progressive who are trying to deconstruct all of that and build an even bigger story a more pluralistic story right and what's interesting is there's dysfunction at all these levels so mm. obviously in the pre-modern you have the you know states in say you know, the Middle East or somewhere that's a, maybe a failed state, quote unquote, that's creating a lot of, uh, you know, difficulty because there's economic challenges, there's resource challenges, development challenges. But we will then in our modern US way, we'll look at that and say, oh, we need to bring democracy. We need to do this. We need to do that. But you don't, you don't quantum jump a society a mm -hmm. whole phase from pre-modern to modern overnight. It's a whole unfolding. Sure. And if you yeah. try to do that, then you have problems. Then you have the modern dysfunction, which is reductionism, this idea that we can have a drug or a molecule that will treat everything, forgetting that humans actually are conscious creatures that have internal experiences and the mind and body mm -hmm. are one continuum. And so that reductionism there, and then the postmodern, I mean, boy, we could talk for hours on the dysfunction in postmodern, um, yeah, everything sure. from you know what, Wilbur calls a perspectival madness, where if no viewpoint is solid, then w where where do you even get a foothold? Mm -hmm. And the idea that there are no hierarchies, except for the hierarchy that there are no hierarchies. So it's internally <laughs> contradictory. And the sure. idea that you know we have woke culture and identity politics and other things that have caused some, some degree of loss of suffering for some, but a lot of conflict for others and have generated a culture war, you know, 2.0 that we have. And so I'm curious, you know, you were talking about a bigger story with the pluralistic postmodern culture. What is that story and why is it so fragmented it feels like? Mm. I think what we're looking at with the, the emergence of the postmodern is um, there are great postmodern figures in history that we can identify. Someone like Mahatma Gandhi, Let's just use him as, as an example. And really, he's a, he's a postmodern figure because he understands the pre-modern structures and he understands the modern structures and he understands how to 
play them to to liberate an entire nation from an empire, which he does very effectively. Um, and he's someone who's gone through these stages of growth. He was a young solicitor mm. earlier in his life before our image of him as the the holy man later on. So there's we we need these this postmodern transition, and we need this intelligence as well. The problem is, is that we're trying to promote people to this level, as I see it, far too quickly in their development. So one of the areas that, you know, and this is widely discussed now that postmodernism has taken hold is the universities. Mm. So we're sending people in their, their late teenage years, their formative years, to do lots of postmodern thinking, which is actually far too early <laughs> in their development. It's probably not something most people will be ready to do until their 30s and their 40s. Uh, uh, when I get asked this question, they say, you know, if you're in like the postmodern malaise, it's because you went to study uh, like postmodern philosophy or media studies like myself, which is a very postmodern subject, uh, when you were 18, 19, and it was far too early so what you need to do now is go and have a relationship, start a business, do all of this grounding stuff, and then come, come back to it. And I think what we're looking at with the woke are the people who haven't, they haven't developed to that stage. They're trying to behave it. And of course, it's completely dysfunctional to, to do that. Um, and so the stories that they relate to it are also completely dysfunctional. <laughs> Because they 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 turn on like the complete um, fluidity of identity. Uh, because this is this is to an extent true, as we were saying before. If you've really developed your identity structure, then you can go and break it apart and see what lies beyond. But if we're trying to do that too early, um, we just throw people into very very deep confusion. The confusion of identity politics that we're dealing with now. This, but the, oh, go ahead. Sorry, the, the, yeah. The the thing to av avoid in this is that our reaction to that, because there's a lot of very confused people in our cultural development, and we absolutely have to avoid demonizing that postmodern stage. That's where we're really struggling in the culture war now. Uh, I, I, man, that's exactly correct. I, I think it is this. Mm -hmm. Like postmodernism, green, plural stage, whatever you want to call it, is a bunch of different names. This idea mm -hmm. is is actually essential to human development. We need it. We need to understand pluralism. We need to under widen our circles of compassion beyond city, state, nation, tribe to all beings on the planet. Right. But if you try to push that early, fast, without the proper development, like I. I I really, like millennials I used to get annoyed with just because they seem to just want to skip ahead and it, that's how it felt to Gen X, right? But it's cool, they're mm. awesome. Gen Z, the latest generation, I just feel really nothing but compassion for. I feel like they're suffering. I feel like we've confused them. We've we've taken off the, the reins. We've over-parented them in some ways and coddled them in some ways. So they haven't taken the risks in the normal development and they are, really lost in a sea where they're, they've got a, devices that they're addicted to from an early age, social media that determines their self-worth, especially for girls. They can commit relational aggression remotely and never have a break from it. So the bullying becomes amplified and accentuated. And so this postmodern malaise, as you call it, because you know, I, trained, I, I went to UC Berkeley in 1991 at age 18. And Immediately, I you know I was the most liberal progressive kid in Clovis, California, in our in our rural conservative <laughs> town, and I went there and I was like, "This is crazy! Like, I, what these people mm. are saying makes no sense to me." It was like a, a foreign language. I wasn't ready for that, mm. and now I think in my later years I've been able to integrate all that, but it it came at a at a cost of confusion and a little anger and everything you said, villainizing the postmodern. God, what are these hippies talking about? <laughs> you know, because that's a common, yeah, common absolutely. response. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it makes complete sense if, uh, if you're, especially where we, we have the, the weight of our society in the modern, absolutely. We're probably at, we're just past the peak of modernity, I would guess. I, it probably peaked like in the 70s or 80s. And um, computer technology is, just throwing everything into into chaos beyond that, and of course, the the forces to keep hold of that are immense. The period of history that I think of is like a 
the the war between the Catholic Church and the emerging kind of states of Europe and uh, the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution. Because yeah, I mean, it's easy to demonize the Catholic Church there, but that the Church had done a huge amount to develop the whole continent of Europe, basically, uh, and drag it up through stages of development. And it had therefore had its power structure, and there was no way it was going to let go of that. And it becomes completely pathological and violent when it's really challenged. And uh, I, I worry tremendously about the conflict between the modern and the postmodern as it's emerging from both directions, because people, of course, who are very rooted in uh, in modern values, when you're initially the postmodern is just something that you mock uh, because it just seems weird and confused. But when the weirdness and confusion is actually overpowering you, of course, your response is potentially very violent in response to that, whether it's all the levels that violence can manifest. And and in the same vein, I think the postmodern looks at the modern with a degree of contempt and condescension mm. to the extent that when it's pathological, they haven't integrated the modern. Uh, they mm. they attack these sort of traditional values, for lack of a better word, and it, and it becomes very this very destabilizing battle. Um, what's interesting is when it's healthy, when you actually do a transcend and include. The postmodern can speak the language of pre-modern, modern, and postmodern, mm -hmm. and actually bridge these divides. Recognize that people are at different stages, but it's but it's it's rare in postmodern, and that actually leads me to the next question, Damien, which is there's something beyond postmodern. There's a next tier, mm -hmm. right? And I think this is where there's a little confusion because in that next tier, something really remarkable happens, which is you're able to start to integrate the previous tiers instead of having them battle. And mm -hmm. the second thing that becomes a little confusing when you're looking at it from the outside is, oh, but wh who are these guys? <laughs> like, are they modern? Are they postmodern? Are they sure. pre-modern? Who are they? <laughs> because the way they talk has aspects of all these. And so people will either call you a new age mm -hmm. weirdo, they'll call you a conservative right-wing lunatic, or they'll call you a lefty progressive nut job. And in fact, you're tier two and you're all of those things <laughs> with, with the shadow, integrated, you know? So I'm curious your thoughts sure. on this. Yeah. I mean, this is something that, that Ken Wilber certainly encountered and uh, I, I greatly admire him, but I'm sure he exacerbated it slightly himself. But when you start trying to speak the integral language, you are, you're the kid on the city block who is not a member of any of the gangs anymore. Uh, and you're potentially exposed to all of the gangs and they will, they will gang up on you. So like, public integral dialogue is very difficult because it's going to at some point trigger everybody at every stage. Um, I think a good example of this is like our climate change storytelling mm. at the moment. Mm. Tell the me about climate this. change is like, um, uh, you see, I can see myself warily guarding against different stage responses to this. So let's just accept climate change is a real problem, but probably not the end of the world. Something that we can mitigate with technology and that we will move to more sustainable fuels. But it's very much in the pluralistic postmodern agenda for it to be the end of the world, because it's a tool that it can hit the modern with yeah. over and over again. We're, we're living through this because if you capitalists and scientists building your technology uh, and uh, developing society and dragging everybody out of poverty. But the cost of this is that we're all going to die because of CO2. And so it's a real issue that is also weaponized mm -hmm. within the culture wars. But recognizing that will trigger all kinds of people, uh, particularly the postmodern stage, uh, who don't want to have that that story told and mostly aren't thinking openly enough to to acknowledge it at all that's a that's a really good example i think climate change is a perfect mm. example of how these different stages 
look at an issue, a global issue of importance, right? It has a political ramification, it has economic ramifications, it has social ramifications, it has cultural ramifications. So looking at a pre-modern, there aren't many of those societies left, but they're just not even on the grid to consider it except to suffer if climate change happens and their small island nation gets wiped out. Then you have the, mm -hmm. the modern, which is like, listen, the basis of modern society is economic progress, which is run on fossil fuels and coal. And so it, you're actually threatening the very fabric of mm -hmm. reality for a modern. Um, and so the postmodern says, oh, you know, there's gotta be a better way. There's wind and all this. And screw you moderns, you know, this, you did this and you're still doing this because you haven't woken up to the postmodern reality and until you wake up that you're endangering the entire planet and uh, we're gonna do everything to, to stop it and make noise about it. This is quite dysfunctional, but then you have the tier two, the next phase, which it's mm -hmm. funny. So Damien, I, I, I rebranded it without knowing it. I call it the alt middle. So it's this radical, mm -hmm. It's an integral perspective. It basically says, sure. yes, and yeah. everything is true, but partial, transcend and include what came before, but this is a view that's quite integrated. You're trying to be, which mm -hmm. means if you look at climate change, you say, yeah, all those things are true. <laughs> so we need to come mm -hmm. up with actual solutions that actually mm -hmm. speak the voice of all the levels of development and, and come up with answers. And that's a very difficult place because you get attacked from all the sides. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not, a, it's not a political centrist position. It is a integrative integral position as far as I see it. Um, so it's not some milk toast, middle of the road thing, but a lot of people will see it that way and get very angry and say, well, you don't stand for anything. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a frustrating, frustrating place to try to nudge folks to, but what's interesting is there is a good percentage of the population that is there or getting there or resonates with it deeply. When you talk about it, when you name it, when you tell stories about it, heaven forbid, they go, that's me, I never even knew it. Holy smokes, tell me more about that. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm getting hung up on how hard it is to do, to, to take this alt-middle, uh, integral sense-making. I think sense-making is also a good term. I think once we get to the point of having the meta discussion of how we're making sense of the landscape, you're doing something essentially integral uh, in that. And it's why I've been so excited by like uh, John Viveki, Rebel Wisdom, your channel now, which I've discovered, um, because I think these are, are having the conversations that can become the story that we need. And I mean, we can definitely get into, I think, like what the story is and the complexities in finding any kind of new unifying narrative that can get us past these culture wars essentially, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the culture wars is so ingrained whenever I was, I was very much a culture warrior, like when I was a newspaper columnist and I look back on some of what I wrote and I like, God damn, you know, I was, <laughs> I was partisanly out to destroy an idea, you know, so I absolutely understand where that's coming from. And of course we're, we will all have been there. And we're all still there in many stages, you know, but I think what we get better at recognizing is the technical existence of bullshit. Um, <laughs> this is like, there's a Harry Frankfurt essay. Uh, he was, uh, I think he's a Stanford or Harvard psychologist, and he writes an essay called On Bullshit. Uh, and it gives the, the technical definition of bullshit, essentially, which is not simply an untrue idea. Um, but an idea that its advocates know on some level to be untrue, but it's very useful for them to, to advocate. Mm. And all of our stages of social development have their own very powerful lines of bullshit that we're throwing at each other through our media. And we have a media ecology that, as you know, I've seen you talk about, is, is largely completely dysfunctional because it's monetizing people's love of of the bullshit that supports their side in the war and unpicking all of this of course is super uh, complex it doesn't mean there's not a simple answer but yeah you know i mm -hmm. this is and this is the central challenge i think of our time it's an, it to some degree I don't think it's hyperbolic to say it's an existential challenge because these are, if we don't actually progress to that next phase and with that, with that, 
with that next phase comes a new mythology, comes a new narrative, mm -hmm. comes the return of, because remember what we lost in modernity may well be that spiritual center, whatever that was, that was driving pre-modern society, but they had, they had sort of um, packaged it into a hierarchical religious structure with dogma and rules and all of that because it was necessary. Mm -hmm. But then the moderns kind of said, yeah, to that, the postmoderns were like, believe, you know, all belief is the same. <laughs> it's just culturally constructed and we can deconstruct it. But the integrals say, well, actually there are these core archetypical, you know, um, senses as a human that we can connect to and there's many paths to it. And so that line of development has to come back online and with it comes a new story, a new mythology, I think, for the 21st century that we have yet to discover or write or know how it even emerges. Is it a, is it a virtual reality story? Is it a some other culture? I mean, do you have any thoughts on what that might be or thoughts mm, on that in general? Yeah, I think I see the parts of it coming together. Because um, I've been very down on commercial storytelling and that's a little bit unfair of me because of course I watch like a lot of Marvel movies, like I have an inner, in a child and an inner adult, which is really pleased by the entire Marvel universe, much more so than than Star Wars, you know. And there's that moment in Avengers Endgame uh, where Captain America has been fighting Thanos, and he's he's pretty much defeated. And his shield is broken, he's covered in blood, everything is torn, he's completely alone, and he gets up. And you have that moment where uh, his, his sidekick, sorry, he says, you know, on your left, calling back to the movie, and he comes out through the portal, and the whole army, like the armies of humanity, emerge from the portal. Mm. Uh, and then Captain America, who we've seen using Thor's hammer, he, he holds out his hand and grabs the hammer. I mean, the hammer hits. And you see these video clips of like cinema studios all around the world, cinema auditoriums, you know, and the audience just goes fucking insane at that point. And you can watch it a number of times. You're going to feel, what are you feeling like at that moment? This is your, your inner tribal warrior. You know, we are like, we're conditioned for quite good reasons to, to have, to have put down, you know, we can't carry our tribal warrior into every situation with us, but we need our hero. We need that part that is inside us for when life really hits us with the worst stuff, you know, you're in, that's when you're in a hero comes out. And that's what we feel when we see that with Steve Rogers, because he's kind of modeled what the greatest kind of hero, especially a masculine hero, would be. So we've taken like that, that inner hunter that we were talking about, that part of the human psyche that formed in the caves, and we're still telling that story when we can do it right and when we can give it the perfect values as well for that stage of our development. Um, and Marvel does that really well. It does some other stages as well, but I think what we can see is that it is there in the storytelling. We can celebrate all of our stages of growth to stop the constant warfare between them. Like I said, I, you know, I love living in what is quite a conservative religious community here in Bali because I think that's where every child should grow up mm. in a really like stable town somewhere mm. with a shared story across the community with rituals that we go and experience and we shouldn't strip people out of there and you know we should love our conservative friends because they're holding on to all these values that we really need and we need them as very liberal people who got shipped off to college and got confused by what was going on and we need the liberal and we need the progressive and the postmodern as well we're not getting out of here without all of these stages of growth and what comes next as well so i think we're looking for stories to to integrate them beautifully together ah 
Man, I mean, what you just described, the little mini journey you took us on is the sort of alt middle stance, which is everything is beautiful to some degree. Everything is important. Everything is sacred. Everything is part of us. And it all has its place and time. And to reject out hand or to villainize or to condescend is, is to really reject a piece of yourself in some way. Because to be a fully integrated human being, those are parts of us. They're part of our, it's like that embryo. It's that tail, it, it gets reabsorbed, but man, without it, the embryo is not gonna develop quite right. The gills, you know, that throw back to when we were in the, in the ocean, but primordial seas, like this is powerful stuff and stories that, that go into that. You know, I have, I'm sure you've seen the series Devs on mm, FX. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I watched that, on the recommendation of a friend. And, you know, that was an interesting kind of postmodern, like nothing quite matters because they're gonna, I don't wanna give any spoilers, but really interesting. So it told a kind of a postmodern and even an integral story where they, they went back in time and they recreated, you know, using this uh, quantum technology and this idea of free will and determinism and so on. It was very complex philosophically, but they could look back at cave dwelling families and experience what it was like at that stage of development and realize the commonalities, realize with love that, oh, this woman is 32 and she had four children, three of them died. She's now doing this because they can watch history happen in this device. I mean, very powerful storytelling. Mm. It's going to be the storytellers who see it first, the answers to this. That's our job is to, is to lay down like, a route that we can progress into here. Sorry, I interrupted what you're going to say there. No, no, I, I had nothing. I, I think you're exactly on point. Um, the storytellers see it first. Interstellar. Yeah. What, I mean, what what when you think about that as a what, I mean, what an what a fascinating film in terms of there's a deep emotional, familial, conservative family love component between father and daughter. There's a brother, they are farmers. In many ways, they've gone back. They've been forced out of the modern into the pre-modern slash, you know, traditional farming culture. And the, the, the hero, McConaughey, just bristles at it, bristles at it. And his daughter kind of is too smart for her own good and is getting in trouble in school. And then the transcendent, act of love itself saves the entire human species. I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts in general on, on Interstellar? You're, you're helping me find an answer here, actually, Zubin, because uh, I think, to use the Vakis time, I think we're dialogue or saying, you know, uh, we're, we're finding some, some new answers. I love it. You know, because the, the thing in the, in the postmodern is the, the distrust of the grand narratives that came before of you know squeezing everybody into one story that has to fit everybody will be it you know the traditional religious narratives or like the modernist colonialist narratives um and so the the complication of, of finding a new story is not just finding one story basically uh we what we have to do is is find everybody's stories and start integrating them back into our culture. Mm -hmm. and this is something that actually happened, like literally in the science fiction community. The, the science fiction community went through a kind of culture wars, which had a, a resolution. And it was about science fiction's reputation for being um, white and male, uh, you know, and nerdy as well, possibly, and telling just kind of one kind of story over and over again. Uh, and there was a growing community of writers from all kinds of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different identity groups within our culture now. Uh, and this kind of manifested around the awards for the major awards for science fiction. And now since 2015, 2016, the winners of those awards are lots of women writers, lots of writers of color, lots of writers from different identity groups. Now that of course, can make some people bristle, you know, there's a response to that as well, you know, because that in itself might just seem like a kind of postmodern culture wars thing. 
But I think it's more, there's a real reason why we need to, to do it because we have all of these mythologies from around the world. They need to kind of become part of our storytelling. Uh, and that's what many of these, these writers are doing, bringing back in kind of uh, traditional tribal narratives and bringing back in uh, religious, especially like Muslim and Islamic narratives into what we call science fiction now, which is why I'm hoping that from all of that kind of melting pot, science fiction will give us kind of new new mythologies for this era that we're in. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. It's really fascinating to see science fiction evolve. When I saw The Last Jedi, I believe that was the one after The Force Awakens, um, mm -hmm. I sat in that theater, I went to saw it myself because my kids were at school and I just, I'm such a Star Wars fan, I had to go see it. Um, and I sat there and I looked at, you know, an Asian woman, you know, give her life to crash the ship into the massive battle station and the diversity of like women, men, different races, all of that happening. And I compared it in my mind to the first Star Wars and the second Star Wars and, you know, like maybe Lando Calrissian threw a little color in there, you know, but to see this actually filled me with a sense of what psychologist Jonathan Haidt calls moral elevation. You, you get the sense of mm. expansion because it didn't, to me, it did not feel forced. And I know there's a lot of controversy there that, oh, they're trying to shoehorn this kind of thing. It felt quite natural and that was remarkable in itself. And so as a kind of meta observer of this, I was like, wow, that's like, postmodernism done right. That's postmodernism at its healthiest there, integrated into the story and you feel for these characters and so on. And, and um, yeah, I thought, it was, I thought it was really, really um, something that, that struck me deeply that, hey, maybe there's hope for the progress of our culture in general. Um, but mm. of course, then there's you know, always the, <laughs> the controversy and the shoehorning and the you know, uh, doing it to do it well, kind of thing. That's a story like Star Wars, so I could make some like narrative criticisms of The Last Jedi, but they arise from trying to do something narratively really difficult. Because if our kind of hero's journey, which is the first movie, is a story we're told over and over again, we know how to tell that story on a technical level. We know what it is. But if we try and tell stories that are, I use the word, which is kind of reviled in many communities, like intersectional, mm. You know, about the collision of communities. And Star Wars is literally intersectional. Mm -hmm. The Rebel Alliance is like an intersectional army. They all come from different planets. They speak different languages. Uh, they're different shapes and body sizes. And they all have to kind of figure it out together against the Empire, which is completely monocultural. It's just uh, a group of clones, literally, on on spaceships. So they don't have any of these issues of how you all work together. And of course, the Star Wars movies are trying to figure out how you tell that story and advance it. And sometimes they do it well, and sometimes they didn't do it so well on a technical level. But that's the challenge for the storytellers. How do you tell stories for a 21st century of 8 billion people on a planet? And we're all talking to each other with smartphones because the old, you know, the narrative, which is just talking to one group of people in Western Europe doesn't work anymore as uh, the, the grand narrative of our society. Mm. Mm. Man, you know, you, you, there's so much in story, so much in our popular stories, in our traditional stories. You know, I think that's why Campbell's original thing with Bill Moyer was so popular. It really resonated you know, as he talked about mythology resonating and he said things, platitudes like follow your bliss and things like that, all of which are kind of true. Um, it really taps in again to the power of story. I, I, you know, when I saw the matrix in 1999, I was mm -hmm. in, I was in my last year of medical school and I had no idea what it was about because I saw the trailer and it was like, oh, there's some magical force field that allows them to float and fight each other. That's all I, that's all I could figure out. And when I watched it and the the twist happened where he wakes up, has his awakening, and he's like, what? I, 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 my entire worldview was destabilized. <laughs> like the, the entire narrative of reality for me became destabilized and it's never been the same. So the idea that what we take to be the story in reality is only partially true, that there's a larger truth beyond that, 
was a fundamental takeaway. And then the scene in the end where Neo dies, and again, the savior kind of archetype, and wakes up finally, has his enlightenment, for lack of a better term, and is standing there and stops the bullets. Like, it was a mystical experience for me to see him do that. Time mm. stopped, everything became one pulsating reality watching him do that. And that's, again, the power of really good storytelling. I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on The Matrix or anything that I've said. Yeah, I mean, think about how many people had that experience in like medieval Europe going into a church and ah. they're read because you have no you have no stories you have no access to stories you go to the church on Sunday because they're going to tell you a story uh, you know and they tell you like part of the the passion of Jesus for instance you know and you would feel that same element mm. because they're giving you the uh the progression of like the transformation of the human spirit that's mm. what you've got with Neo it's what you've got with any savior, savior figure. Um, and we kind of, we have a sense that it's, it's possible. I think of a, a Jordan Peterson line in one of his Rebel Wisdom interviews. And he says, you know, we don't know what's possible if a human being really fulfills their potential. Mm. Uh, and this kind of, you know, you have the human potential movement around this as well. What really happens if a human being uh, gets to where we could get, where our culture could take us, where our technology could take us, learning and education, if we could get it all flying together? And these stories, The Matrix or Star Wars or Dune is another good example of this. You know, they're giving us a kind of nod towards where that might be and the costs that we might pay to get there. Um, and we've all, every human has had some part of the experience, some kind of taste of the transcendent or some time when you performed kind of out of your socks at something that you were doing. And then these stories kind of tune us back into, into that. And that's that's super powerful, I think. You know, interesting on that angle, there was the animated series that came out after The Matrix called The Animatrix. And mm -hmm. in that series, there was a series of little vignettes. And one of the vignettes mm -hmm. was an athlete who is in The Matrix and he's a runner. And in an act of flow and transcendence, his physical peak activity in a race wakes mm -hmm. him up and he wakes up in the, in the you know real world with the tube and he's just like what and it, it, it's again it's this act of this being in this transcendent flow state there's many paths to get to it and he wakes up that mm -hmm. way unfortunately then the agents of the matrix realize and the agents to me have always represented our ego defenses the ones that do not want us to escape from the prison of the own story that we've constructed for ourselves and uh, they they put him in a wheelchair and <laughs> he's permanently disabled, but his last sure. word in the thing is free. And uh, and it was really powerful. I still remember it. I saw it years ago when it first came out. Yeah. yeah. And we're kind of trapped at the moment in what I would call um, suboptimal stories about our, our culture. Because we, as I said, we had this science fictional story about space travel and colonization and we're still kind of playing this out in a way like elon musk is the lead character in this story of going to mars in a rocket but then without that story we kind of um what do we do if it's just us trapped on a planet together ad infinitum you know where do we go and we don't have a vision of that so i think it's why we start looking at things like uh, uh, climate change narratives and dystopias, particularly. We're, we're caught in dystopias like zombie uprisings or the totalitarian government that's going to run the world. And on one hand, they're valid warnings. We do want to avoid the dystopia and trying to achieve the utopia can lead us to that. That's fine. That's the warning there. But it's also a kind of um, neurosis I think, of not having a vision of what the future might be. And these transcendent stories, I think, are 
a key to to where we uh, where we might go. Although I see the downsides as well. That we start thinking again about what we could really become as a human race. You know, even if we don't leave the planet, what our full potential is. What if every human being on the planet could be a real creative spirit in the world? And I think we need to restart thinking about, um, you know, how our technology might take us there instead of being trapped in, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse. Uh, we need to start painting visions of how our technology could actually liberate us all to make wonderful creations in virtual spaces and um, build new kind of structures of of human interaction and cooperation. Uh, it's it's difficult to do because we feel so trapped in this negative vision at the moment. But I think we need to reclaim an an optimism about our future and ourselves in doing that. Yeah, you know, I have this uh, theory that it's not just mine, I'm sure, but that the reason we don't see aliens um, here or uh, mass evidence of you know galactic organization is that as a, as a species progresses, it actually realizes it doesn't need to go anywhere. It's a psychological transformation, a revolution, an involution, a finding everything you need here. And whether that's in technology in a virtual space or whether it's in you know, some singularity uh, uh, like Kurzweil and these guys talk about, or whether it's really just simply going, hey, it's all right just to be, they don't need mm. to do this Elon Musk, make a big penis and shoot it into Mars. Um, and and I, do, I do wonder about that. Okay, so real quick, you mentioned something about this idea, what if every human could be a, reach their creative potential? And you've talked before about this tension between a consumer culture, which is what we have now, and the potential mm -hmm. for a creator culture. Can you help me understand where you think that might go? Because I feel like that's a big piece of what the future might look like and a new story mm -hmm. might look like. Yeah, you know, I had an experience of watching like a young relative online was talking with her and she's doing Minecraft projects, you know, and she, her and her friends basically built like a Minecraft world over a weekend, like completely decentralized. It was a school project, but, you know, they went through all the planning stages and they built everything in this world and it was all working. Uh, and she's in her like early teens. Mm. Uh, and so much of like our education systems, which we really value because we fought to get them like universal education, but is it really helping people now to send all, all of our kids off to, to schools for where they're largely being babysat, I think. Um, and what would we actually have to, uh, to do and change in our society just to release people to do this? Because creativity is really our, our natural default state. And we have to have it kind of crushed out of us to go and participate in our, our kind of corporate, in our consumer culture at the moment. And the reason why we, you know, consume, uh, why it's called the consumer culture is because that's what we fill the space with that should be creative. And this was, as, along with storytelling, this is my, my insight from my 10 years working in Leicester, uh, that we would do things like the team I was working with, uh, put on poetry nights, uh, painting events, you know, anything to give people a space to do, have some creative outlet and be celebrated by their community for that. And honestly, in terms of mental health and then a lot of physical health that came on, that's the best intervention I've ever seen mm. for people. Far greater than the medication or one-to-one -one therapies for people. People need community. They need celebration. They need creative outlet. And when they find that, they just start to become their full potential. It doesn't it doesn't need much more than that. Really. That's, that's a, not being too utopian, Zubin. <laughs> no, no, no. That's the story we need to be telling. That's the story we yeah. need to be telling. Um, so it's interesting because we talked about how each human recapitulates kind of the general growth of the species in some way and mm -hmm. previous species and so on. For me, you know, when I went through medicine, I found that creativity 
that I was kind of, that I always connected to when I was younger was beaten out of me to some degree out of necessity because there's only so much brain space and you have to do this and you have to be professional and there's a lot of external pressure on you and so on. And so it would creep out in certain ways on rounds with the students and so on. And I I do the comedy and little creative bits, but it was pretty much crushed out of me. The way that I assuaged my emptiness was I was a consumer of high-end audio gear. So I would collect vacuum tube amps and turntables and I would listen to jazz with, you know, high-end headphones and you know, obsessed neurotically about different cables and how they sounded differently and different power sources. And just hours of of time neurotically fiddling with this stuff trying to fill a hole that never was filled. It was never quite enough. And then as I transitioned to making videos, to making music videos, to doing parodies, to being a creative and starting to do that full time, the 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 contrast <laughs> in happiness, in fulfillment, in connection, in peace was exponentially different. And I think if we gave people the opportunity, like you said, I think school is like a conditioning babysitting thing right now. Um, if if you know, I think Sir Ken Robinson talks about this in a very I, met, I, got, I had the honor of meeting him and we got to talk for a while. Brilliant guy and yeah. communicates very well about the failures of our education system. If we really encourage and enable creativity, which means, hey, if AI can do all the menial stuff, then we can focus on what actually matters. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's where we have to go. Mm. And we got so much evidence now about the underlying causes of uh, mental health. Uh, everything from systemic things like depression to, uh, you know, the really serious issues, schizophrenia, um, into, uh, you know, addiction issues, the addictions which are just kind of rippling through our society. And I, I think you understand these even better than I do. And I think creativity is widely understood is the answer to, to all of this. Because human beings can bear, you know, so much if it has meaning from the perspective of like his meaning crisis again, you know, and it's not about everybody being a YouTuber, but I think this is, this is not the greatest kind of creativity uh, out there. You know, um, it can be you know, a trend that we see in society, you know, so much is the person who's burnt out and they just want to go and be on a farm uh, and dig some stuff up on a farm. Cause you're once again, actually related to something really meaningful mm. that you're having a, an impact on. I see it in, you know, the anger about the lockdowns in COVID, you know, because people are being removed from their meaning. Mm. And I think our conservative friends are much better at being closely related to this. You know, that business that you're running, which has been shut down, that's not just a job somewhere. It's the thing that you have built and it's your meaning in life. And you have every right to be angry if you're made to shut it down even if it is for ultimately, uh, you know, for the best. So we need our, um, our creativity in the broadest sense. And that's, that's one of the values we can take from our conservative structures that, that we've lost, I think. Yeah, once again, it's pulling f truth from wherever it is and integrating it and respecting it and saying, hey, instead of calling people COVID idiots or COVIDians on each side of this thing, can we understand that there is some truth here and some meaning to be found in all of this. And in the healthcare world, there's recently been quite a bit of writing that we've lost millions of jobs in healthcare, but some of those are layoffs, but a lot of them are resignations. And the reason people give is, well, I have been forced to do a job that I care deeply about that called me without resources, without protection, and without hope. Because when... Mm. Our ICUs are overwhelmed and people are dying and we have nothing for that stage of the disease. All we're seeing is death. And this and, and this is where the frustration comes up with people who maybe choose not to vaccinate then they end up in the ICU and they're asking for ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and so on. And, and it's, it's generating this kind of moral distress in, in healthcare workers and they're leaving. And there was a story in the Atlantic recently where um, they quoted an emergency physician who said she she quit finally after years. She thought she was going to be a lifetime ER doc. She quit. She couldn't do it anymore. And she was walking in a pumpkin patch with her children for Halloween, and she just started sobbing, just burst into tears. And they asked her, why, why was that? And she goes, I, I realized I was happy. 
Like I was connected to meaning here with my kids in this pumpkin patch. And I had, I'd been so disconnected. I hadn't felt that in so long because you know, you put up the walls and so on. And so part of the story, like you said, the creativity is not like going on YouTube and being a jackass. It, although that, that can be fun. Um, it, it's, it's as simple as doing what is authentically you, you know, being able mm. to do what's authentically you that gives you meaning and connection. Mm -hmm. um, I think you live longer when you do that. Your blood pressure is lower, your cortisol is lower, your mental health is better, your relationships are better. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a, a, a medical professional, but so I can only make assumptions based on the many industries that I see and, and interact with through my professional work that um, everyone is more and more abstracted away from the source of meaning in the thing that they were doing. So, you know, that because of needs for efficiencies, profit seeking, uh, merging organizations together, and just the sheer size of the, um, the companies that uh, we're building and the infrastructural layers of society that we've put together, that more and more people, and of course, this is, you know, an old problem. This is like the root of Marxism uh, here that, you know, what we are, are doing as a nurse, for instance, it might simply be untenable to do it in a, an infrastructure of that size mm -hmm. when the psychological reward for doing it is about a relationship to some number of people, a ward of people that you can work with. Uh, and this is where the modern has been very bad at integrating, you know, what we need to bring from the other stages because a nurse is, is an ancient archetype in our stories and we can't we can't expect it to just be industrialized and people to be able to adapt to that man you said you weren't in healthcare i think you understand it better than <laughs> many people who run healthcare that treat nurses mm. as a commodity as a labor cost not as a sacred ancient connection with a latin root that means to nurture or doctor from docere the latin root to teach and mm. we we've lost some to some degree in the mechanization uh, of healthcare, what I call health 2.0, uh, this idea that we're an assembly line and we take these modern uh, abstractions and apply them to healthcare. To some extent, there's truth there, right? Everything is true but partial, but the shadow is quite deep and the failures of it become apparent. So what is health 3.0, that integral, holistic, inclusive, technology-enabled, but not technology-enslaved type of human relationship-driven healthcare. And that's that's mm -hmm. my term for integral healthcare. I, I call it health 3.0. So that's what we're trying to push for in our movement. And, and, and one thing that you mentioned again is this idea of creator. How do you make a living doing that? Well, now with technology, you can have subscribers that will pay to be part of a thing. You can teach a course and people will pay to get some of your hard earned wisdom over the years. And so there are ways to do things that are new that I think will enable creator culture into the future as well. I'm an optimist as well about where we might go as a, as a human species. And, you know, if you're in the disruptive industry building uh, world, you know, I think the question might be, what would now disrupt healthcare, for instance, you know, just as an example, and it's not more modernist systems of healthcare, it is integral healthcare, that's actually going to give you the profitable next step yeah. for the for the industry, you know, because that's how you're going to see the new technologies coming that are going to make your, you know, whatever billion dollar piece of kit you bought irrelevant because some integral answer will do this much better. That's right. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that the disruptive mindset will, will take us to the integral. That's my optimistic vision. No, I think you're absolutely right. And the one caveat I'll say is that disruption cannot be at the same stage of development as modern. It has to be, like you said, mm -hmm. an integral disruption, something that we mm -hmm. even have trouble wrapping our heads around yet because not a lot of us are at integral, uh, but I think it is, it is, it's crucial. Um, and, and we won't even recognize it. You know, one interesting thing in Dune, just to kind of bring it full circle. <laughs> so sure, let's do that. Dune, um, cause I've taken a lot of your time, brother. Uh, the, the doctor in Dune, Dr. Yui, 
Mm -hmm. The way that he treats um, Paul Atreides in the movie and in the book is, it, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a world 10,000 years in the future or something where, the year 10,000 where computers have been, artificial intelligence has been outlawed due to a massive disaster in the past where they tr basically took over humans. And so even doctors don't use a ton of equipment. He touches and manipulates Paul basically using the force for lack of a better term, but there's some human technology he's using that is transcendent of that equipment. And he's able to diagnose and treat doing that. And I think medicine is gonna to start to assume more of a mix of technology and this transcendent uh, energetic human component that we don't fully understand. So that's my guess if I were a betting man. Well, you know, uh, the pre-trans fallacy yes. from, from Wilberian thinking, um, that what what we are coming to will look a lot like a lot like the past, um, but we we don't want to get them confused. But there is also usefulness in seeing that we may go back to something quite similar to where we were. And you know, they found um, some of the the frozen Ice Man bodies that they have found like in the Alps. So they found like one body, and he he was like fifteen thousand years old. And he defrosted, so they still had the skin from his body, mm. and it's covered in um, tattoos with all of the uh, the pressure points from acupuncture. Oh wow! So they were doing this fifteen thousand years ago, because I mean, for a start, what else did you have? But yeah. Also, there was a knowledge and an insight there, and I think as uh, you know, this is going very into speculation from where we are. But as we start to understand, you know, I'm a yoga practitioner as well. You know the the real energy systems that underlie our body. We might well find ourselves a hundred or five hundred years from now with this completely transformed understanding of the body. That means our doctor Ua is just using some kind of force to to heal us. And this is the beauty of science fiction that we can think out into that space. I I love it, man. And you know, after this meditation retreat, where I experienced some energetic stuff even in the body, I. I Nothing is off the table anymore. And I was the hardest core skeptic of this stuff. You know, I, I've made videos ridiculing this stuff. Uh, and, and I just wanna, I wanna end with one last thing about the pre-trans fallacy for people who don't know. I think this is very important actually, especially in healthcare, because people get this confused. So the pre-trans fallacy, as I understand it, is that pre-rational thinking or pre-scientific thinking looks a certain way, right? It, you know, it seems magical and so on transrational thinking where we have science, we transcend and include science, and there's also this new thing that has to do with human consciousness, actually can look and be confused with that kind of magical thinking, but actually it's, it's, it's transrational, it transcends and includes all that, and it's actually very, very awesome, but the problem is it can look like spooky woo-woo. And I think that's where I think, modern medicine needs to really start to integrate and grapple with those things rather than discounting them outright. Um, and also we have to look out for the quacks and the quackery and all the pseudoscience and misinformation. Yeah. So that that's my take on that. Um, anything you wanted to talk about that we skipped over in this uh, rambling interview that Maybe I loved? I just, um, you know, what you were saying there about the medical the medical quacks, and we could expand that that point to, you know, all the people who've who've made the pre-trans fallacy, and maybe some people are doing that deliberately out there. So, you know, advocating a kind of return to, uh, you know, living in, maybe living in, in huts, for instance, you know, that's how we would all be happy if we became hunter-gatherers again. That's kind of an emerging narrative that you can see. And it's, it's like, it, we'll only be happy if that story also includes antibiotics uh, <laughs> and their smartphones because we're addicted to them, you know? So it, the pre-trans fallacy is an important idea and it's important to our our storytelling and to our, our mythos as well that the, the bigger point is that we still have to be rational. You know, we can't give away reason and rationality we have to include those as well in our into our progress I, i'm i'm really glad you mentioned that because i would be a fool if i didn't mention like something like vaccines the pre-trans mm -hmm. fallacy can be turned around and said that you know what vaccines are garbage we need to go back to natural infection as an immune 
generator because that's how we did it for millions of years. Yeah, and millions of people died, kids died. Mm -hmm. So we incorporate what we've learned on the journey of the human species and we can transcend and say, okay, it's not always for, you know, there's ways to do it. And yes, there's some downside. So we have to work on those, but you don't toss that out. So absolutely brilliant. Damien. We can't just. What's that? We can't, we can't just uh, retreat to our, our old mythos. That's the way I'd summarize it. Oh. We can't just go back to the old story. We've got to go forward. How did you just manage to bring it fully into story? I guess that's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. This this was um, really. I, I I learned a ton, and to think these things out with um, somebody like you, who really has made a, a life's work of doing this, is such an honor. So thank you for taking the time, and um, I'd love to talk to you again if you're game, specifically um, about certain science fiction pieces. Just just this is just the nerd in me. I just would love to do this, and yeah. I think. The takeaway for the audience, especially my healthcare audience in particular, is story matters. Our collective mythology matters. Our stages of development matter. How we treat others matters. Love is important. These are all themes tied into the new mythos that the 21st century is going to need. And uh, we're all going to be a part of it. Um, any other thoughts, Damien? No, just thank you so much, Zubin. You're an incredibly uh, generous interviewer and you, you listen so closely when people are, well, when I've been speaking here. Yeah. And uh, that's very important because it, I've discovered things in our conversation and that's been fantastic. And I, I really appreciate that. It's easy to listen when uh, someone's speaking uh, wisdom. Um, Damien, I will link to your website and all your resources and your courses and uh, pieces of work. And uh, I'll also link to the Rebel Wisdom uh, interview you did because I thought that was just wonderful about Dune. Uh, and guys, uh, Share the show if you want to become a supporter to support creatives like Damien and myself. Uh, feel free. The links are always everywhere. And I love you guys. Uh, we are out. Thanks, brother. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much.